This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co host Bob Pastorella, we chat with Masters of Horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Richard Kadri. He is the New York Times bestseller of the Sandman Slim series, amongst other works, including collaborative graphic novels and over 50 published short stories. And this was a wonderful conversation. We start off with an interesting horse story. Cascor had tipped us off a little bit about that. And then, of course, we talk about Sandman Slim, we talk about pursuing writing professionally and a whole host of other things. But before we get into it, a little bit of an advert break. Award-winning author Sonora Taylor's latest short story collection, Someone to Share My Nightmares, is now available. With a foreword from V. Castro, Someone to Share My Nightmares features nine stories that weave horror with sensuality. The stories include mysterious sea creatures, sinister home devices, a randy Christmas demon, and more. Healing Patrick Burke calls it a veritable treasure trove of dark delights, and Laurel Hightower calls it sexy and deliciously chilling. Someone to Share My Nightmares is available in ebook, paperback, and hardcover on Amazon, and an ebook and paperback through other online retailers. Learn more at SonoraTaylor.com. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from DT Publishing. The absent mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward Ayers, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife Malene slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers a dark force behind Malene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Malene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. Okay, and with that said, here it is. It is a conversation with Richard Cadry on This Is Horror. Richard, welcome to This Is Horror. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you here. Now, when we were speaking to Cassandra Kaur, she informed us that you have a hilarious horse story from your real life. Now, does this mean anything to you? And if so, we'd love to hear about it. Well, yeah, Cass likes this story. Uh, I, I, I basically, I punched a horse. Uh, but the horse had it coming. That's the important part of this story. I used to do a lot of martial arts and boxing, which the horse didn't know. But I was with an old girlfriend at her family's uh, for Thanksgiving. And the tradition was after the meal, you'd go for a long walk around their property. They, they had acreage. They had horses, little corral, things like that. So we went out for the traditional walk. It was cool. It was a nice day. Um, my girlfriend and her little niece were sitting on top of what seemed like a reasonably behaved horse. And then about halfway through the walk, the horse went nuts and started bucking and, and jumping and no one could control it. And it was about to buck my girlfriend and this little bitty kid off onto the road. And when no one could control it, I, I don't know what this says about me. My memory went back to boxing training. And it was like, there are certain places you can hit <laughs> the person that will basically turn out their lights. And so I walked up to the horse and I just hit it as hard as I could in the jaw. And to everyone's credit, the horse just stopped. 
and kind of looked at me, <laughs> <laughs> kind of looked at the road, and just started walking again. And <laughs> we had no more problems getting it around the uh, walkway and back to the uh, back to the corral. I don't recommend this for anyone. It was a spontaneous thing. Everyone was fine in the end. But yes, I don't put it in my bio, but yes, I punched a horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's at least two stories of spontaneously punching animals that we've had on the podcast. Because Alan Baxter basically told us about when he punched a kangaroo in the face. So, you know. Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure kangaroos need punching every now and then. They're aggressive little bastards. Yeah, <laughs> and then as I recall, it was uh, trying to fight his dog, and so you know. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Australia is one of those places I'd love to visit, and probably never will, because everything about Australia scares me, especially mm. monster killer spiders. I don't like spiders, and every. Australian story seems inevitably to end up at spiders. Uh, and no, I just, you know, uh, I, I'd have to go there in like, you know, some sort of refurbished spacesuit from NASA to protect me from all the wildlife. Yeah, I mean, Australia is so dangerous that even the weather is trying to kill you. Even the bloody sun <laughs> will try and kill you. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. My one, uh, my favorite Australian story is uh, an American writer friend who I actually posted about on Twitter and Instagram yesterday was Gustav Hosford, who was a Vietnam veteran and wrote two great books about the war, The Short Timers and The Phantom Blooper. Gus got fed up with America. He was not a happy guy after the war. So he left, he tried to figure out where's the farthest place I can go to get away from Americans. And he picked Perth, Australia. Not a bad choice, except the year he moved there, he took all his possessions with him, was the year of the America's Cup. So not only was he overrun with Americans, he was overrun with rich asshole Americans. And it was just torture for him. And, and he, he stayed there as long as he could, and he moved on. Um, it was uh, sometimes, you know, you, you try and run from something and you run right back into it. It's it's just sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm <laughs> just incredibly unfortunate timing on that one. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. But everyone should track down Gus's books. You can't find them uh, in print anymore, but you can. Uh, Gus is dead. You can't find them in print. But if you hunt around hard enough, uh, actually, if you follow me on Twitter, you can find a place where you can read it online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the short timers was uh, part of it was the basis for uh, Full Metal Jacket, right? Full Metal Jacket. It was very, yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket was based on that. In fact, I stayed with Gus in London while they were making the movie and I actually got to talk to Kubrick on the phone a couple of times. Wow. I tried to convince him to make Crash, J.G. Uh, Ballard's Crash, at one point, and uh, he wasn't interested, and he didn't know who I was. He just wanted guts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I punched a horse, and I talked to Stanley Kubrick. Those are my two fame cl claims yeah. of fame. <laughs> yeah. I know for a second you were going to tell us that was another time you punched a horse. It's like Kubrick wouldn't make Crash, so I just, you know, did what I do to let off steam. I had to walk around, found a horse, punched it in the face. Exactly. Went over to Buckingham Palace, found out, found one of those guys on a horse and just socked it. Like, this is for, this is for you, J.G. Ballard. Bam. Yeah. Yeah. That, that'd be risky business. You probably don't want to punch one of those fucking horses. I mean, you, there may be consequences. Yeah, yeah, no, I restrained myself. I was very, I was a very good boy. I'm a very good boy when I go overseas. Yeah, yeah, probably for the best. Well, except for, except for France. I had an incident in France, but that was... Okay, well, we were immediately going there. What happened? <laughs> I, I, can, I can sum it up pretty much in a sentence without going into gruesome details, but uh, many, many, many years ago, pre-9-11, uh, I broke into Versailles with a Peruvian philosophy professor on Christmas Eve. 
<laughs> we, we, got to, we got to walk around Versailles by ourselves in the fog. And that's all I'm going to say about it. It's a long time ago. I'm sure the statute of limitations is over and I can go back to France at some point. But that was a great that was a great damn night. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's cool as hell. <laughs> yeah. That is a sound bite. <laughs> that, yeah. that is something. Well, I mean, I'm wondering, and based on what you've said already, I mean, goodness, what are you going to say to this? But I wonder, what early life lessons did you have growing up? I tell you what, the life lesson I learned from growing up, I had a really weird childhood, not a, not a pleasant one in a lot of ways. Um, and I learned to be afraid of a lot of things when I was young. So the life lesson I learned that I tried to tell myself when I got away to California, um, I was a bit older, and what I try to tell the younger people these days is say yes to more things. Take more risks, say yes. Because um, fear is the thing that's gonna hold you back more than anything else. Fear of failure, fear of being a fool. Take a chance, say yes. And that's, that's my one bit of wisdom from my younger self, because I grew up saying no to a lot of things because I was, I had a very frightening childhood. Yeah. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, it's, yeah something that even a lot of adults need to hear to say yes more. And we do fear failure and we do fear discomfort, but it's only, mm -hmm. I feel, through pushing through that and through not only confronting, but experiencing failure, that you will inevitably have some sort of success and get through to the other side. Exactly. Whether it's art or whether it's dealing with people mm. or whether, again, back to around the world, like traveling, mm. go someplace that scares you or, or intimidates you. Uh, or that you just don't know about, you know, I went to an old girlfriend took me to Nepal once and I really didn't know much about Nepal and I had a great time. I got sick as a dog there, but I still look back on it, uh, as a great, great time. And if you can't travel around the world, there's always some place in your own town you can go to. Just go see something new, go see something different. It'll change you, mm -hmm. you know, so saying yes can be a very small thing. You know, go to that weird restaurant you heard of that serves food from a place you're not sure where it is. Try that. Yeah, well, maybe we're going full circle and you need to say yes to Australia. Just send uh, a message to Alan Baxter so you've got a bit of protection from the roo puncher. Uh, if he can show me how to punch spiders, uh, I might yeah. consider it. Yeah. I don't know if he punches them. He sent us photos of a spider, like, in his house, which uh, I, I assume all people living in Australia do just have pet spiders hanging out there. So maybe get a yeah. hotel, maybe don't stay at his. <laughs> I'm just going to go to Australia with a lot of uh, plastic I can put over the windows and duct tape the doors yeah. shut. And... Uh, now, like I said, walk around in a spacesuit the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like people won't be able to figure out, are you from NASA or are you preparing a kill room? Is it some weird combination of the two? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I'd wear a sign that says, don't be afraid of me, but I think that would scare people even more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder, do you remember... The first time you told or you wrote a story and what kind of reaction you got to it? Um, yeah, I mean, the first time I tried writing a story, I was probably about, I'm going to guess, eight years old. I wrote a little horror story about crab monsters in Egypt. Just because I liked the Sphinx and I thought crabs were scary. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I got about a good five pages of that, out, out of that. Uh, five typewritten pages, in fact. My mother had a typewriter and I was always fascinated by them. And I think that's actually for a lot of writers being, when you're young, being interested in the tools of writing. 
uh, can be as much of a draw as wanting to tell stories. So I was fascinated by her tools. And I don't remember what the story was called. I wish I uh, wish I still had it. But yeah, giant crabs in uh, Egypt attacking uh, soldiers, mercenaries. I don't remember much about it. Just remember giant crabs and the Sphinx. I think I illustrated it too. So I wanted to draw the Sphinx and some crabs hanging around it. The next story I can remember writing, I was about 16 and it was a horror story that ended up with an ax murder. And I didn't have much of an audience back then. I didn't know what to do with horror and stuff like that. So I showed it to my mother and my mother gave it back to me, said, this is very good. And she never read anything of mine past that. Like for the rest of rest of her life, she had all my books, all my articles, all my short stories, and never read a single one of them. Right. <laughs> she was proud I was a published writer, but she didn't know what I she didn't want to know what I was writing. Well, I mean, that alone is quite the endorsement for the axe murderer <laughs> story, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think so. I think so. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, were you always like reading and watching horror? I mean, was that the kind of stuff that you grew up with? Absolutely. I was a fan of monsters for as long as I can remember. I started, you know, um, monster movies were the only thing I wanted to see. Some science fiction, too, but monster movies were my favorite thing. And I grew up, like a lot of kids, uh, I was reading Poe. Later on, I discovered Lovecraft some of the other people, um, Arthur Macon, some people like that. Uh, and then, you know, sort of kid versions of that stuff that I got tired of very quickly. Oh, I remember Michael Avalon wrote a book called Tales of the Frightened that I loved. It was like these little, first time I'd run across, I don't know if they were micro fictions, but they were very short little stories that were sort of like Twilight Zones that you had this horror set up with some kind of little punch or twist at the end and i loved that i had actually had a record album when i was a kid of boris karloff reading some of those stories so i would watch movies i would read the books and then uh, my mother was kind enough to get me these weird albums of people reading poe people reading things like tales of the frightened and having karloff do it was just perfect yeah, yeah. I mean, what a narrator. <laughs> what a guy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm a big Karloff fan. Where I'm, people are always trying to fight me on uh, social media, but like, what about Bella Lugosi? It's like, fuck Bella Lugosi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Dracula fan. I'm not a fan of his Dracula. He was a terrible Frankenstein. He was very good in Son of Frankenstein as the, uh, I forget his character's name, right. as basically the hunchback. Um, caretaker who kept Frankenstein alive after Bride of Frankenstein, but I, I'm not a I'm not a fan of Bela Lugosi. He was also very good with Boris Karloff and the Black Cat, but mm -hmm. people who love his uh, Dracula, I just not a fan. Not a fan. Much more of a Karloff. Much more of a Karloff guy. You seem to have to choose in a lot in America. You have to have teams. I'm on Team Karloff. Yeah. Yeah, I have noticed that. There does seem to be, like, a lot of polarization. <laughs> it's like, pick your side. Mm -hmm. Which one are you yeah. on? It's kind of like the English music scene. I've noticed there's a lot of... There's a lot of divisions there and a lot of rivalry between different genres of music. The first time I was in London, I didn't realize that. Like, you walk into certain kinds of record stores and you ask dumb questions and people would get very, not irate, but they'd look at you askance. Right. Like, have, have you even heard of music? I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just looking for a record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, from right in this axe murderer story at 16 and then getting your first novel published in your early 30s i mean at what point did you think okay this is something that i want to pursue professionally well i wanted to be a professional writer my whole life and actually by the time i published that book i was a professional writer i was doing uh mostly journalism back then i started out as a journalist and i was able to 
just scrape by doing articles for uh, for various magazines. Um, the the biggest one being Wired. I did a lot of work for Wired in the early days, and in fact, Wired. I wrote a fairly well-known sh- uh, science fiction story for them. Their first, the first piece of fiction they ever used on their cover. I worked with a um, microbiologist, and I wrote a story called, um, oh my God, I can remember the, the, the movie version name, uh, but not the story. Oh, Carbon Copy was the short story, and it was on the cover of Wired magazine in the late 90s. And it was, I wrote it, because I had a journalism background, I could write it as a straight news story. And what it was was this discovery of the first human clone. And so I, I had fake interviews, I had a fake medical team, I had the parent. It was about a child they discovered was a clone of another child who died. So I was able to write this in a very straightforward, non-sensationalistic manner, and just sort of state it the way you do in a straight, in a straight news story. And the story was successful enough that apparently Wired magazine was inundated with people wanting to interview me and the child, <laughs> the clone child. And it was, it was like, you know, Wired even put the date of the stories two years in the future, but no one, no one noticed that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, this is, this is a piece of fiction that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but yeah, no one cared. No one cared. They just wanted to find the clone and uh, do an interview. Yeah, and I I absolutely love it when films and books do this. And, you know, I mean, with found footage, for example, where you're blurring mm. the lines between, okay, is, is this real? Is this fiction? And, I mean, that happened with uh, Stephen Volk's Ghost Watch in the UK. That um, was, that's a great piece of work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think the most notorious one is probably Cannibal Holocaust. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which, as I recall, is it, was it Diodato who, who directed that one? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the director's name. I'm blanking on it. But, yeah, he was actually brought up on charges He uh, as a murderer for all this footage he had of people dying. The Italian authorities just decided it was all real. And he actually had to produce the actors <laughs> to show, look. They're not dead. This was the movie, you morons. Yeah. But no one was used to that stuff back then. He he did it convincingly and gruesomely enough. That's a great film. I used to work in a video store, and whenever snotty young men would come in saying nothing scared them anymore, I've seen faces of death. What do you have? Try to scare me. We'd always give them Cannibal Holocaust, and they'd always come back crying. (laughs) Because they just weren't ready for it. Yeah. Yeah, for some reason, when I was younger, I decided that that would make a good first date film. And uh, suffice it to say, there was not a second date. (laughs) (laughs) That didn't work out very well, did it? Oh, no, no, no. I don't fucking even know what was going through my mind. But I I guess it was a little bit similar to, you know, the people coming into the video store. (laughs) Uh, who had seen Faces of Death, and she's like, oh, I, I love horror, and there's not been that much that has scared me. It's like, okay, why don't we watch Cannibal Holocaust? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm, yeah, that may have been like one step too far. you got to find that middle ground. Yeah. I, I know someone who showed, what's the French film? Uh, Martyrs. Yes, <laughs> yeah. On a first date. I actually know two people who showed Martyrs on a first date. One was your situation, where the person was like, bye. Yeah, uh, but, the other one, but the other one worked out. They're actually still a couple. It was just like, yeah, mar- they bonded over martyrs. So you never know. Oh, yeah. It could have worked out. Yeah, yeah. I guess you know it's a test, and it's like if if we'd have watched Cannibal Holocaust, and she'd have been in for it, it's like okay, you're the one. However, right. she wasn't the one, and <laughs> she got Absolutely. out of there pretty fucking quickly. <laughs> It's not that good of a first date film. It's a last date film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be a great category to have. If they had video stores anymore, what a wonderful section that would be. Last date movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. <laughs> you know, Martyrs, Man Bites Dog, Cannibal Holocaust, um, you know, probably yeah. uh, Mondo Conde. Mondo Conde. Yeah. 
that would be a great a great section yeah <laughs> so listeners you know write in or tweet us at the Cesaro what are your last date films <laughs> yes. oh, if we get enough we could just put a little article up on it <laughs> you know? that would be great that yeah be great. yeah well I mean of course I want to talk a little bit about Sandman Slim and I mean something that I find particularly interesting is I mean at, at this point so you'd put out three novels which had been pretty well received but in terms of kind of sales they hadn't done as well as you wanted and so you you'd yes, said yes. just say the least yeah <laughs> yeah you you'd said if Sandman Slim didn't sell well then you were going to give up on writing books so I wonder put in yeah the stakes at that all-time high i mean how did yeah. this affect the writing and the planning of sandman slim well i i told myself that i was going to write i wrote an outline of the whole first book and i wrote like 50 pages of it and i told my agent if this 50 pages plus this detailed outline don't sell or don't sell for a decent amount of money um, you know, cause my, uh, I, I was going to, going to quit because my first book was an ace special, which paid more than paperback originals back then. And everything I'd done after that paid less and less and less. I, so I was going, I was going down the food chain. I was spending years writing things and, and just, um, making no money being demoralized. So I said, I'm going to take one more big shot at this. And yeah, so I wrote, I wrote Sandman Slim and I wrote, like I said, I wrote 50 pages and a very detailed outline. And I said, this is it. And my good luck. And I, I, I have to emphasize luck in this is I did not know of the existence of urban fantasy as a genre. When I wrote Sandman Slim, I'd literally never heard of it. So I wrote Sam and Slim in complete isolation. Um, and fortunately, I wrote it at a time when urban fantasy was really starting to ramp up. Like it was, it hadn't hit its peak yet. It was people were really getting into the stuff. So I hit at the right, I hit the right book at the right moment. And I think that has a, a lot of, to do with the success of that first book is I did it when it had to happen. And it was just, it was just pure luck. Like I said, I did not know urban fantasy existed. I didn't know who Jim Butcher was. I didn't know who Kim Harrison was all the big names back then. I just wrote it blindly. I mean, I was more, I didn't know who these people were. I was actually more influenced by people like Roger Zelazny than any, any of these contemporaries. So I just took a chance and it worked out. I mean, I actually had a little auction for the book, you know, um, three places were interested. Then it was down to two places and it took a couple of days to work out. So like I said, the right book at the right time, plus a lot of luck and writers who are successful, who don't believe in luck, I think are telling themselves a lie. I think they're trying to comfort themselves. Anybody who's successful in publishing has to admit to a little luck along the way. You can have a great book at the wrong time and it goes nowhere. I know tremendous writers who haven't had the kind of career or success they should have because simply because the book got lost because it wasn't, the publisher didn't do it right. The timing was wrong. A million little things can happen. So I'm really grateful to both Harper Voyager and whatever, you know, my, my editor, Diana Gill back then and whatever demonic forces were behind me to get that book out to that place at that time. I find that amazing that you, that you wrote that without having any knowledge of it. Cause I, for me, I have to like completely dive into whatever genre I'm trying to get into. I want to make sure I'm not doing something that someone else has done. 
And it's, I, th- I think yeah. that's really fascinating, super cool that you were, in, in a way, you were oblivious to it. Yeah, and completely. It makes sense because when I got into urban fantasy, and I'm not trying to talk bad about anybody or anything like that, there's some great work out there. But when I got into it, you know, when you go and you start searching, hey, you know, urban, uh, who, who's who's doing over fantasy and, and so in my searches on google i would add the word gritty and nor and sam uh, Anselm came up every fucking time and i'm like okay well let me try this and bam i was like this is exactly what i'm looking for the other stuff is good but some of it seems a little whimsical and sometimes you just want something on the dark side yeah and that's but yeah i was like I, that's the first time i've ever heard that that you didn't even know what it was. No, so, I, yeah. I'd never, I'd never heard the term until I talked to my editor about it. She said, "Oh, this is a great urban fantasy thing." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I thought she made it up. I thought she made up urban fantasy on the fly. Like, oh, that's a thing to call it. Sure, why not? Um, like I said, I was, cool. m- I was more influenced by writers of the '70s. You know, that's why the book. If you look at the covers of the book. You know, they're all done like 70s movies poster. I mean, there's a very mm-hmm. 70s aesthetic to the whole series. And that's, again, people like people like Zelazny from back then um, and a few other people. But I guess I got, like I said, I got lucky. I think the other part of my luck was because I didn't know what urban fantasy was, I wasn't afraid to do anything. I, I just dove in and it's like, I just threw everything I wanted into the book and it came out the way it came out. I mean, you know, some of it later, um, well, here's something I was going to say, I was going to say something later bit me in the ass, but it didn't, uh, but I'll tell you why, because when the first book came out, the first thing people said was, oh, you're ripping off Jim Butcher, which I think those books and Jim Butcher are not, not much, you know, Harry Dresden and James Stark are really not very much alike. But the other thing people were saying about the books is um, the Kasabian, I guess, um, I'm trying to remember now, I haven't read the books in years. I guess Dresden has like a talking skull that he talks to for advice or something. I'm trying to remember, but I think it's a skull. Yeah, he has a skull. Okay, so I had Kasabian in my book, who is a guy who got his head cut off. So Stark has this talking head, and I guess Butcher had this talking skull, and people were saying, ah, see, that's where he ripped off Jim Butcher. And so that's the one thing that not being aware of urban fantasy got people yelling at me, saying that I was ripping off Dresden. In the end, I don't care, because I love the character of Kasabian, and I love... I love Kasabian's arc in this series as much as I love Stark's. Yeah, I can see how people would do that, but you know, if you if you have like so many people writing the, the same thing, like let's say like everybody's in a cubicle or something like that, and if, you know you know the story, everyone said it. If you had ten thousand people writing the same story, eventually two of them would come up with the exact same fucking idea. You know. Oh yeah. And so, I mean, you got you got to throw that kind of that kind of you know, well, you're ripping someone off. Eh, you got to kind of throw that out of the wind there, because I mean, it, even though it, it's the same possibly in concept, it's the execution of the two things are completely 100% fucking different. So, yeah. and it's you know, but I don't know. I could see how people would say that, but you know, especially in this day and age. But it's like, nah, yeah. like guys, come on, you didn't really got to go there. Well, that's again, you know, I was joking before about the kind of like Karloff versus Bela Lugosi teams. I think in science fiction and fantasy, there are a lot of teams. And if you're on one team, you have to hate the other team. So Team Dresden hated me and hated Stark and hated Sandman Slim. And that's okay. Um, They get to do their own thing. And, you know... I didn't hurt Jim Butcher. Jim Butcher didn't hurt me. We, we both published a lot of books. And in the end, it all worked itself out. And I think by the time the second or third book rolled around, people had stopped with the year ripping him off stuff. And uh, plus, I knew enough that I hadn't that I was able to kind of brush a lot of that stuff off. 
it was a little annoying at first, but then, I mean, what are you going to do? I'm not going to throw Kasabian away. He's too good a character. Right. Yeah, and I think it's a good thing that you hadn't read any Jim Butcher before or weren't even aware of urban fantasy, because if you had have been, then it might have, you know, impacted what you were doing, or even worse, you might have decided not to kind of pursue this book. And, well, you know, 12 books later, 13 stories later, and it's a pretty bloody good job that you did. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I do consider myself lucky not to have known because I did go in innocently and just sort of start throwing ideas around. And I would have probably been much, much more self-conscious if I'd known about this stuff. So, yeah, ignorance, ignorance paid off that time. Yeah. And we talk about some of the old school writers. And of course, I mean, James Stark named after Richard Stark. So there's a homage right there. Yeah, I wanted to give him credit. I read some of the Richard Stark novels when I was about 18 years old, and they blew me away because I never read anything um, where characters were that tough, where the pro style was that like chiseled out of concrete and i immediately thought i wonder if you could do something like this in science fiction or fantasy and i mean it took me a million years to get there but i uh, went with sandman slim i saw yeah you know i i I thought back to uh, richard stark and i was like this is the place this is this is the place to use those tools and so i didn't want to pretend that I, I didn't want to pretend that I wasn't affected by other writers. So I wanted to acknowledge Richard Stark and his Parker series were a big influence, uh, especially on early Sandman Slim. That's why, besides James Stark, there's a villain named Parker mm. in, in the first Sandman Slim. So I wanted to make it clear, like, you know, um, if I'm ripping anyone off, it's Richard Stark and it's not, it's not Jim Butcher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've made it pretty easy for people to see that connection, but, yeah, apparently they were too obsessed with Dresden to notice. (laughs) They probably weren't familiar with Richard Stark is the problem. Well, that's the thing. I mean, a lot of of readers can get stuck in one genre and never read outside it. Um, To my, you know, I was very happy, on the other hand, to have people go, oh, Richard Stark. And you go, yeah, you know, readers who'd read this stuff, I say, oh, Stark and Parker, and would understand immediately, like, oh, okay, you're acknowledging something. Well, yeah, it's exactly what I was doing. I didn't want to hide it. Yeah, and I mean, the cool thing about doing things like that is you'll often then find with with younger or newer readers that because you've got that little reference in there they're now going to discover the work of richard stark i mean we see that i hope so mm, yeah yeah and i we, hope so yeah and it's often something you see in music as well and you know people going back to the origins when you've got people like kind of paying tribute to the likes of Black Sabbath or mm-hmm. songs like Inner Garda de Vida and people are like, right. yeah, let's let's check out I, the original. I remember going to a Tool concert once many years ago and they were t- the opening act was King Crimson. Oh, wow. What a fucking yeah. combo. <clears throat> and King Crimson. <laughs> They did their set and they got very mediocre response to it because everyone was there to see Tool. All the all the kids were there to see Tool. But Crimson played, did a nice set, went away. And then to his credit, when Tool came out on stage, like Maynard, before they started playing, Maynard came out and said, now you know who we've been ripping off all these years. Nice. Nice. And that was what a great gesture to try and tell mm-hmm. tell these people like no 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 i know you didn't like him tonight go back and listen to king crimson yeah like the the tragedy of that story is you know there were all these people watching king crimson who who didn't you know realize you are in the presence of greatness i know that was uh yeah that was kind of sad at the time but like i said you know again it was a bunch of, it was mostly kids yeah. at that concert who had no idea who, uh, 
you know, these old farts were on stage. Yeah. I think giving credit, I think giving credit to, um, giving proper credit to people who influenced you is, uh, is a good thing. And again, I mentioned Zelazny. Zelazny is a great writer, mm. almost forgotten now. He wrote science fiction and fantasy. I don't know why these writers become invisible. Like he died, I don't know, probably 20 years ago now, longer. And people remember Philip Dick and people like that. But for some reason, guys like Zelazny disappear. And I find that very sad. It is sad, but I guess the kind of shining light or the beacon of hope, depending on which awful cliche you'd like to choose from my 9 a.m. brain, is that, right. you know, sometimes these people come around again. So just because they're not in the zeitgeist at the moment, I mean, it only takes like one prominent reference in pop culture mm -hmm. or a new kind yeah. of movie adaptation and then suddenly they're in fashion so you know there's hope yet absolutely absolutely as long as the books are in print yeah um, mm -hmm. i think someone in fact was was trying to make a series out of the uh, the amber mm -hmm. the amber books so if that happens I remember hearing like, something about that yeah, so if the Amber series happens, it's last to be back on top. The way Blade Runner put Philip Dick way out into the uh, general public's consciousness. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, even like a reissue or something like that. I'd heard like a, you know, Robert Aikman, but I'd never read any of his work. And they started reissuing his collections with these really mm -hmm. cool looking little covers. And I'm like, oh, I'll <laughs> buy one of those. And I read it and I was like, fuck me, man. I yeah. am like in the, I, I'm, I'm now I'm in the twilight zone and I don't want to leave. Uh, right. and now he's like one of my all time favorites. And you know, here I am. I, I, I was probably, I'm 54. I've read the first one probably with the last four years. So 50 years of my life went without Robert Aikman. Yeah. So it's just it's one little thing. It's like, I like that cover. Hmm. Yeah. That's a collection. Exactly. Let me, let me click on that. I'm going to order it in paperback, you know? And I think that's the other problem with some of these books, like the 70s covers were great and the reissues were just, ugh. They just looked like 80s reissues with just a, a lot of 80s covers. A lot of 80s pop culture does not appeal to me. And a lot of those, a lot of science fiction and fantasy covers back then were just like, I know this is a great book, but I'm going to be embarrassed if anyone sees me reading it in public. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, some of those covers were not, weren't weren't very cool. Yeah, it's like the the Dell the Dell Abyss line got better in the nineties. Yeah, but uh, some of those I have that book too, Paperbacks from Hell, which shows all the you know the covers from the seventies and eighties, and oh, it's like a nostalgia I, trip. I and love some of those covers book. are really good, but man, there's a lot of shit. There was a lot of crap. Paperbacks from Hell is a great book. I, I believe Grady Hendrix did that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Really terrific book. If you like. If you like the books and the history of books, Paperbacks mm -hmm. from Hell, highly recommend that book. Yeah. yeah. It's book porn. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a whole section on crab books in that, too, which uh, there, was a, there was a big crab horror writer at some point. So I was happy to see my crabs come back into uh, pop culture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly after your first story at eight years exactly. old. It's like, yes, here exactly. we go. <laughs> I'm vindication. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, talking about covers, despite, you know, the, the adage, people do absolutely judge books by their covers. And I mean, we spoke about the very distinct aesthetic that Sandman Slim has. So, I mean, on that basis, was that something that you kind of spoke about early doors? Did you have much impetus in terms of the covers and the aesthetic? I had some, but in fact, it was like the second or third book that came out in England. It was actually the Brits who changed the Sandman Slim covers to that 70s aesthetic. Mm. And so my American publisher just said, yeah, let's do that. We don't need these American covers anymore. Let's just start over with the British covers. And uh, I've, I've 
I've been so happy with that since then. And then they went back and reissued the early books with the British covers. So got really lucky there. Uh, one design company, and of course I'm blanking on their name, that design company got the aesthetic and, and saw B-movie 70s America mm. and ran with it. Well, there you go. It seems that the Brits did something okay. It's a good job you didn't punch the Queen's horse after all. That's right. <laughs> well, see, that's, that's my guardian angel going, don't, 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 don't punch any wildlife in England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, horses aren't the problem. There's a, there's a lot of cows, you know. You get trapped in a field full of cows, and you know, maybe you have to start punching, I don't know. They seem to turn up out of nowhere, like the amount of this kind of countryside walks I've been on, and then you have a look around, and you're basically surrounded by the motherfuckers. Oh, my God. I think that would be very disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> It's not ideal to to understate just a, it. <laughs> just have a ghost herd appear appear around you. That's very Hookland. I don't know if you follow the Hookland account on Twitter. It's this brilliant account that 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 goes through the history of Hookland, which is a uh, an old um, state. I don't know what, what the different sections are. They're not states, provinces, whatever. In England, they got wiped out. That was sort of written off the map in the uh, 80s during margaret thatcher's time but was full of of mystery and magic and crazy weird tales of ghosts and um it, it's a wonderful account and and definitely can see uh, a hookland folk horror aspect just a herd of ghost cows surrounding you and it's like who owned these ghost cows what do these ghost cows want have i have i walked through a fairy door into something i shouldn't have walked into yeah. is this field inhabited by things i don't want to know about and if so how do i get out yeah yeah I know. i've never heard of this before in my yeah. entire life Th those, my god yeah those photos on the hookland account i mean they're really rich and Gorgeous. evocative and i mean i i know that yeah. you you are very au fait with photography i mean that's one of your passions yeah. as well and i mean yeah. i know you you've spoke about taking shots with your holga as well oh i love my holga i love my holga it's mm. a terrible little camera but that's the great surprise of holgas is it will do strange things that you didn't expect uh, they will give you photos that you could never have planned. And that's the wonder of Holga's, such cheap little junk cameras that it will do strange things behind your back. And half of them you'll just fall in love with. Yeah. Do you use like an old school Holga at the moment or do you go for the digital one more? What's your kind of, what, what do you well, do if you, yeah. My, my film Holga finally fell apart, which wasn't a terrible thing because they stopped making the film I liked. Right. So the Holga broke at the same time the film disappeared. So I've now switched to a digital Holga, which isn't as idiosyncratic as the film Holga. So I've had to figure out ways to make it more idiosyncratic. And there are little tricks you can do, um, filters you can put on the front of the digital one and there are lenses you can use like the telephoto lens for a holga distorts wonderfully so you can use that telephoto for long shots like a regular telephoto or you can shoot things close up with a telephoto lens and get wonderful vignetting get wonderful distortions of things twisting and elongating in ways they shouldn't um, so if, if you like messed up photos and you like Holgas, I'd suggest tracking down a, uh, a telephoto lens for it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm tempted to get, to get the Holga digital and get some of these lenses and, and just fuck about, particularly being in Japan. I could really, you know, take some creepy shots, I reckon. 
oh, that's great, you're in Japan. I think that's one of the few places you can still find them where they don't cost a fortune. Well, there you go, ideal. And yeah, in in Japan, like they're very good at just preserving their technology. <laughs> you can buy like things from decades past that's basically in mint condition. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Is that Akihabara kind of area, or is that just all electronics? I, I, I've read about. Oh, I mean, a- a- Akihabara is kind of the the hub of of technology in in Japan, partic- you know, in the Tokyo area in particular. But I mean, yeah. in most cities, there's like these used electronics stores where, I mean, I, I'm a big gamer as well, so you, you can uh, you can buy any video games console in pristine condition if you so choose. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, that, that sounds like big fun if you're uh, in, into old tech. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, something you've spoken about before is, of course, the the origin for Sandman Slim simply being two separate notes that you had in different notebooks. One saying Hitman from Hell, the other just saying character name Sandman Slim. And so you said before we started recording as well that you were going through i think a notebook looking at an old idea and now working on a new story so i think these two bits of information really underline the importance of keeping these notebooks and writing down any idea that you have because you never know when it's going to come back whether it's a notebook or a computer file never ever ever throw anything away even if it's a story you think is terrible, keep it because there might be one sentence in there that will inspire something real and better. So you're ripping yourself off is a great technique and keep all your ideas, no matter how questionable they seem, because later on you might find that idea and go, well, this version of the idea is terrible, but if I take it and twist it around, it becomes something great. And that's just, that's really what Sandman Slim was. Well, it took me a long time to figure out what Hitman from Hell meant. My original thought is that he was like a, a mob hitman. And then I went, oh God, that's boring. I don't want to write about a guy who was a mob hitman who went to hell. It's, it's just terrible. So, so the next thought was, well, it's somebody who wasn't a hitman, knew nothing about killing uh but learned that was an ordinary person who was forced to learn that in hell and so hell changed them in that fundamental way where they went from a regular person to a murderer by uh not having any choice in the matter i mean stark ended up as a gladiator the hellions got bored with him at a certain point just threw him in the arena expecting him to die and he didn't die in fact, he discovered he was very good at killing things, and it developed from there. But it was nothing he went for. It was nothing he knew about. It was nothing he wanted. It just happened. So that's that was that was one idea of mine of like taking the concept of a hitman and twisting it around and like what is the opposite of a mob hitman? It's someone who fell into it and now can't get out of it. Yeah, and I wonder too. I mean. As the first book opens, Stark has just spent 11 years in hell. How do you even get into that mindset? Well, Stark in that first book is clinically insane. I mean, he's been tortured in hell for 11 years. Wakes up back in the world on fire for various circumstances. So his introduction to the world is escaping hell, discovering he's on fire, putting himself out and looking around and realizing what's happened and then going on a rampage to kill everybody who wronged him before he went to hell. So that's what I mean by clinically insane. All Stark, that first novel is a revenge story. Mm -hmm. All Stark wants to do is kill, kill, kill. And in my mind, that's an aspect of PTSD, of madness, of of abuse it's an abuse novel and having been through some of that stuff having been through 
um, shrinks and drugs and things like that. I think I was able to find myself, find my way into Stark's uh, mindset relatively well and relatively quickly once I found his voice because I'd been through some of that stuff. Not obviously not to the extent that Stark was. So you take your real life and you exaggerate it. You know, you take, oh, this crazy thing happened. Here's 10 times that. And you apply that to your character. So especially that first book and Stark's origins um, return to Earth, there's a little bit of, that's a little bit of me coming out of the madness that was part of my uh, earlier life. Thank you so much for listening to the first part of the conversation with Richard Kadri. Join us again next time for this second and final part. But if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, if you want to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Not only do you get early bird access to each and every episode, but you get to submit questions to each interviewee, and you get to listen to exclusive Patreon-only podcasts such as Story Unboxed. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Malene by Josh Schlossberg from d t Publishing. The absent-mindedness, the nonsensical ramblings, the blank stares. Ward Ayers, physically disabled and confined to his Jersey Shore home, can only watch in dismay as his beloved wife, Malene, slips further and further into dementia. Until finally, Ward uncovers a dark force behind Malene's decline and must plumb the depths of sacrifice and selfishness to reclaim his wife and preserve humanity's future. Find Malene in paperback, hardcover, ebook, or audiobook online or at a bookstore near you. Award-winning author Sonora Taylor's latest short story collection, Someone to Share My Nightmares, is now available. With a foreword from V. Castro, Someone to Share My Nightmares features nine stories that weave horror with sensuality. The stories include mysterious sea creatures, sinister home devices, a randy Christmas demon, and more. Keely Patrick Burke calls it a veritable treasure trove of dark delights, and Laurel Hightower calls it sexy and deliciously chilling. Someone to Share My Nightmares is available in ebook, paperback, and hardcover on Amazon, and an ebook and paperback through other online retailers. Learn more at SonoraTaylor.com As always, I would like to leave you with a quote. And this is from Marcus Aurelius. This is something that may help you if you're having a little bit of a struggle at the moment or if you're dealing with conflict. Kindness is invincible, but only when it's sincere, with no hypocrisy or faking For what can even the most malicious person do if you keep showing kindness and if, given the chance, you gently point out where they went wrong right as they are trying to harm you? So that's it, folks. Battle unkindness with kindness. I'll see you in the next episode for part two with Richard Kadri. But until then, take care of yourselves Be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.